Really? Say again? Yeah, I'm, 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 def I definitely, okay. Um, we, last, on Monday, okay, we, fin we talked about vaccines, and it's all very exciting, right? But here's, we're going to start with a little game. I'm going to be an obnoxious parent who doesn't want to vaccinate his child. And I'm going to give you all the arguments, that typical arguments, that these parents tell to doctors and nurses and PAs and nurse practitioners um, explaining why they don't vaccinate the children. Okay. And well, my uh, first argument will be that um, honestly, you know, I've heard I'll, I'm not a very convincing actor, so give me, cut me a slack here. Uh, I've heard that vaccines actually contain mercury and can poison you. Retaliate. Okay. Mm hmm Okay, so there are studies that show that, yes. There's another good, huh? Another great argument. Yes. We'll get to this, that statement. Um, my argument would be, do you eat tuna? Tuna contains orders of magnitude more mercury than any vaccine. But I you know what's the funniest thing? Vaccines that are used in the United States do not contain mercury. After all that um, shitstorm that started, you know, mercury, the, the preservative that keeps vaccines from getting bad, the only reason why Tamurasal was added to vaccine was to prevent them from getting bad. Because some vaccines were used in batches. The doctor would have uh, a, a bottle, of a flask with, I don't know, 10 doses. And they would stick the syringe, pull out the dose, give it to a child. Stick another syringe, pull out another dose, give it to a child. When all that situation and all that uh, you know hype started, the pharma companies decided to oh, screw that. We're going to just package them by single dose, so we don't have to add any preservative. So they don't contain. Okay, that's you can just look. That's it. We excluded it. Other countries here, yeah, yeah, they 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 do have that. Okay. Um. Okay, so uh, Teresa suggested that um, chances to get the disease are higher than to get poisoned by the mercury. Well, I would argue with that. Look, um, I'm 38, and in my entire life, well, it's not in, I didn't see a person who was acutely suffering from polio. I saw people who did before when I was a kid. But there's no polio. So I'm not at risk, you know, I'm, I'm not going to contract polio, I'm not going to contract measles, you know. I haven't seen measles, I haven't seen mumps. There's no, I didn't see anything like that. What are the chances of contracting measles or mumps or polio, but, you know, my kid can be poisoned by mercury? I'm really stubborn, I'm really stubborn, okay, so mercury is still on the table. Come on, retaliate. I don't want to vaccinate my child. Other people, they vaccinate their children. You know, they will that that will protect me probably. Excellent. Excellent. It's a very compelling argument. 
uh, people who are anti-vaccine, they don't operate with the scientific evidence. They operate with anecdotal evidence. My friend vaccinated her kids and they got autism or they, I don't know, um, ended up having C in social studies. So that's why, you know, because of vaccines. That's anecdotal evidence, right? You can find anecdotal evidence with anecdotal evidence only. Find cases of people not being vaccinated getting the disease. Give them examples of Amish communities in Ohio and Pennsylvania. Give them example of uh, Orthodox Jews in Netherlands. You can match, like map of Orthodox Jews living in Netherlands and map of outbreak of measles in Netherlands. They match. Well, not map of Orthodox Jews. I mean, it's not Nazi Germany. Nobody maps them. But uh, the lack of vaccination is tied to locations where there is a huge population, huge communities of extremely Orthodox Jews. They, they do not vaccinate. Okay? That's, that's, that's a great argument. That your child not being vaccinated, having mild infection or asymptomatic infection can transmit the disease to someone who cannot get vaccinated. Um, I have anecdotal evidence. My, my wife's colleague, my wife's co-worker back in Russia, her son died at the age of one of measles between first and second vaccinations. He didn't build up the immunity yet, contracted from someone and that's it. Okay? That was really horrible because some asshole didn't vaccinate. Okay? Uh, well, Vaccines cause autism. You know the answer. Huh? Yeah. Correct, yeah. The papers were retracted. He lost license. You know where he is now? Austin, Texas. Yes, he's British, so he's now in Austin, Texas. The funny thing is that uh, Dr. Well, he's not a doctor anymore. Andrew Wakefield still promotes the idea that vaccines, well, MMR causes autism, which is a total and entire bullshit. Okay, there's no link. Um, so yes. Uh, yeah, did I, I? I did show you the website. How vaccines cause autism? No, I did not. Some of you have been exposed. That's the get great answer. That's actually a very good website that uh, thoroughly explains the entire thing. Um, this is the one. It's not the ad ones. That's. Actually, here's the link to the compendium of research that's done by American uh, Academy of Pediatrics. They pretty much compiled all the data okay, on um, vaccination, link between vaccines and autism. Well, there is no. <laughs> there is no link between vaccines and autism. Yeah, I mean, you can donate, which is... I know, let's see. A crappy beer and a whole case of beer. <coughs> okay. Um, so we got autism. We got... Timer cell. Oh, well, come on. Uh, screw the religion. Seriously, I mean, if now we'll we'll get to this. I still I still deny. We'll get to this. Pharmaceutical companies make shitload of money from vaccines. That's my statement. <coughs> not a shitload. Vaccines are definitely not the most profitable um, article that they produce. Things like Prozac or, I don't know, Viagra, give way more money. Um, not. I don't think it was federally funded. 
think about this. <coughs> Sildenafil citrate, which is Viagra, is um, an inducer of nitric oxide, donor of nitric oxide. Initially, Viagra was used, not used, but developed for people with a high blood pressure. It's a very important vasodilator. And the uh, ability to treat erectile dysfunction was a side effect. And the legend says that the guy who was running Pfizer at the time, he went to the gym and spoke to his personal trainer and mentioned that we've got that weird side effect. We don't know what to do with it. And his personal trainer said, dude, are you crazy? It's a gold mine. And it was. Okay. Uh, and research that led to that discovery was probably federally funded in the universities and stuff. But to convert the research results into the actual drug, it's a long road. And it was the, the price of the drug is, we talk the development, we talk about billion and more. So it was funded, clinical studies and everything was funded by a company. Uh, so vaccines are not the profitable part of pharmaceutical company business. Now imagine that somebody says, you know, my religion doesn't let me to vaccinate children. And you are in the practice, in the medical practice, whether you are a nurse practitioner and have your own practice or you work for a doc. Well, if you have your own practice, what would you say? I'm just curious. I don't, I don't, I'm not telling you, you must say this. I would have my own. I would say, well, I appreciate your religion, but then you're not going to be my patient anymore. I can't, I can't put my other patients at risk of being infected because your religion prohibits you from vaccination. I very much appreciate it. Go find a dog that will treat you. Okay. Uh, for school enrollment. Uh, hmm? No, in Ohio, uh, as far as I remember, only two places, California and city of New York require vaccination for the enrollment into the public school and no religious or philosophical exempt can be applied. If you don't want to, private schools are open for you. Yes. I see. Uh, I see. So they they may or may not have vaccine. Uh huh. Well, it's still, I don't know if people could argue about philosophical exempt, no? It's a lame excuse. I, I'm, not ask, I'm not saying that it's not a lame excuse. I'm, I'm not saying it's a valid excuse, but the problem is, in some cases, it's a legal excuse to be exempt from vaccination, and that sucks. Okay, so, yes. 
Uh -huh. Vaccines? Oh, yeah. So when you get vaccinated with vaccines that we have available, and we have pretty much inactivated vaccines, let me go back and just remind you what we're talking about regarding vaccines. So we, we can get inactivated vaccines, right? And these guys. And we can get attenuated. We don't have any other. Well, we, we have subunit. They have B, okay? So when you get either of those, they mostly induce antibody response. Live, well, active vaccines, attenuated vaccines like MMR, they also induce a bit of a T cell, well, T cell response, we'll talk about it. And, um, but the only thing that can be easily measured in the lab to see if you have immunity against the disease is antibody levels. And as you saw before, when we talked about antibodies, their levels pretty much will go like this. They will decline with time. For some vaccines, they may stay elevated for year two, three, four. For others, they will decline pretty rapidly. And in order to boost them in, so they can get certain level in the blood, you have, to, you have to get repetitive vaccinations like we do with polio, like we do with MMR, DTaP, pretty much take everything. It, it ensures that your protection is, is good enough over the lifetime, okay? Another thing is we get vaccines as kids. And kids have slightly different immune system that does not form such a robust immune response as adults do. Does that make sense? So when you go into the nursing program, okay, and they take titers of, I don't know, hepatitis B, okay, and they find that your antibody titers, antibody levels are low, does that mean that you don't have immunity? Not necessarily, but that's the only so-called correlate of immunity, the only parameter that we can assess. Does that make sense? So if your antibody levels are high, you definitely have, you're definitely immune. But if they're low, you may be immune or maybe not. So they will send you to get a booster just to cover all bases. Does that make sense? That's how it works. Okay. And in some cases, for instance, if you would go, I went to, we had to go through um, the doctor's like medical examination to get a green card. And you have to have certain vaccines. And I went to my physician with the list of vaccines that I must have, including chicken pox. I said, how old are you, 35? Well, whatever it was, I don't remember when we applied, what, what year it was. 35, by that time, you're immune to chickenpox. You either had an infection, well, you probably had an infection. It may have not been with symptoms, but you definitely were exposed. So I wouldn't even bother about chickenpox at this time. So just 100% of people at this age are immune. Does that make sense? So they can give you, say, okay, you cover this, you cover this, you need the shadow of that, you need the shadow of that. Okay, just because of the timing and stuff like that. For, depends on the, on the pathogen. For instance, DTAPs, we get like five shots of diphtheria, tetanus, pertussis, which gives us pretty much long-lasting immunity. MMR, measles, mumps, rubella. It, was ter it turned out that mumps vaccine is not very effective. It's about 85% effective. So 85% of people actually develop immunity. We take three shots, there is still a chance, very little, that you are not immune to mumps. And there were outbreaks of mumps, especially in the universities, because it's really easily transmitted by a respiratory route. There was an outbreak in some university in states when a bunch of people got infected. Most of them were not vaccinated, but a good portion was, and that's how we discovered vaccine is not that tremendously effective. And that actually is another thing that you have to think about when you encounter a person who doesn't want to vaccinate their kids. Think about it. They will bring up the case. We had 100 people acquiring mumps, 80 of them were not vaccinated, and 20 of them were. So vaccine is crappy because 20 vaccinated people 
got infected. Any idea what to say? So you have 100 people that acquired mumps during the outbreak. It's hypothetical, okay? 80 of them were not vaccinated, but 20 of them were, and they still had mumps. And the argument is, vaccine is crappy. Because Hmm? Yeah, but they can say, well, they got the vaccine and got, in, in, you know, got infected, got disease anyway. I look at 20. If nobody what? How do you know? I'm making arguments. Huh? That's more compelling. You look at 100 people that actually got the disease. 20 of them were vaccinated. How many people were exposed, were vaccinated before, and didn't get the disease? Maybe we're talking about 1,000 people that were exposed and never got disease because they were vaccinated. So that's, that's statistically, it's not a valid argument. Does that make sense? The only problem, again, I refrain myself from arguing with anti-vaxxers because I'm wasting my breath. They aren't, they believe in that. You know, I cannot, I cannot convince somebody not to believe. They don't use logic, they don't use science, so, I mean, it's going to be your job. Make an effort, <laughs> but don't expect too much. Okay. Uh, here in, in Ohio? Well, we were very thoroughly reminded, look, you got to sub submit your immunization records. I mean, my kids are up to date. It was not about vaccines. It was about immunization records. So we brought them to school and everything was fine. I don't know if I could come and say that my religion, I don't know, pastafari pastafarianism, Probably religious or philosophical exempt. Yeah. Yes. Well, that's good. Or they do a slow spread of vaccines where their doctor, wherever they go to, allows them to, instead of having me every three months, it's every six months instead of three. And they're compounding all the vaccines all at once and present with another belief that they Yes, that is largely false. Everything all at once was made all at once and everything was made all at once. That's not true. That's not true. Oh, another argument. Very good argument. That from the anti-vaxxers. Isn't the infection the natural way? Isn't the natural way better? Oh, screw other people. I don't care about other people getting infected. There you go. Uh, somebody brought up the case of like natural selection. Things that don't kill you, make you stronger. My immediate retaliation was, well, are you ready for a kid not to be selected? So, they usually start to think about it. Yes. Mm-hmm. Post exposure? Yeah, post exposure. Ah, ah, immunoglobulins against hepatitis B. It's immunoglobulins, it's antibodies. So, yeah, so the idea in treating immuno, using immunoglobulins for 
treatment is that when you accidentally get exposed to the virus, like hepatitis C, hepatitis B, um, the hope is that antibodies that you receive will prevent the virus from actually infecting the cells, will neutralize the virus. Remember neutralization? Will neutralize the virus while it is on its route to the liver. Okay? But the only vaccine that, to my knowledge, works post-exposure is rabies. That's the only one. Okay? Well, good job. Good job. You will have to, you will have to tell this people. Now we're going to continue talking about the immune system and we will discuss the T cells. But in order to understand how they work, yes, yes, they shouldn't. If because, ooh, uh, When the kid has a fever, it's a sign of disease, right? Elevated body temperature is the sign of disease. If the kid is sick, it means that his immune system either working at the you know, higher intensity, it can be weakened by the infection, that's absolutely normal. So the kid may not build up the proper immune response. So you should wait till the child is healthy and then give him vaccine or her vaccine. That's absolutely normal. You have to be examined by a physician before getting vaccine. Generally they ask, do you feel fine? And that's understandable because they can check if you have diabetes, cancer, heart disease and whatnot every time you go to get vaccine. So if you feel fine, go for it. Does that make sense? Okay, let's continue with the immune system. And we're going to talk about the, uh, first, first of all, we're going to talk about the, the concept that is known as MHC or <clears throat> major histocompatibility complex. Okay, now I think words major and complex are pretty obvious, right? Major is the the major and complex is the complex. Histocompatibility. Histo, what does it stand for? Tissue and com tissue compatible. So major histocompatibility complex allows your immune system to distinguish between what and what. What do we mean when we say tissues are compatible? Bingo. Self and foreign. Okay. Okay. Self versus foreign. There are two types of major histocompatibility complex. And as almost everything in biology, if there are two types, it's going to be type 1 and type 2. Is that clear? Two types. Okay. Um, so how these types work. So these are two generic cells. Now, MHC type 1 can be found on all nucleated cells. Meaning, starting from neutrophils to liver cells to neurons to epithelia of intestine. The only non-nucleated cells are erythrocytes, red blood cells, and platelets. Bless you. Um, yeah. All right? You got it? So, the, so what is MHC? MHC is the complex, it's a protein, well, several proteins, on the cell surface, okay? And their function is to present the antigen. They present the antigen whether they are self or foreign. If I am a cell and my arm is the 
MHC1 protein, I present self-antigen. This self-antigen demonstrates that I am good, I'm self, I'm not foreign, I'm not infected, I'm okay, I shouldn't be attacked, I'm a normal cell. Okay? If cell gets infected, okay, that infection, say it's intracellular bacteria, uh, it produces a lot of proteins just to replicate. Does that make sense? Active infection, during active infection, a lot of proteins are produced. Those proteins are, by intracellular proteases, they are chopped in pieces to peptides. And those peptides are presented by the MHC class 1. So if I'm infected, instead of self-antigen, I will present the antigen of something that infects me. Does that make sense? This thing, that antigen of whatever infects me, will be a red flag for the immune system, will allow the immune system to say, that's wrong. This, this cell should be destroyed. Does that make sense? MHC class 2 can be found on antigen, sorry, antigen presenting cells. There are three antigen presenting cells that you must know. Dendritic cells, macrophages, and B cells. They all can engulf the pathogen, okay, and destroy it and break it down in pieces. Does that make sense? So imagine now that there is a pathogen. that is engulfed, broken to pieces, and one of those pieces is presented on the surface by MHC class 2. One difference that I want you to notice right now is that MHC class 2 presentation is not the result of infection. Pathogen is being taken into the cell and destroyed. Does that make sense? It's not the result of infection. Do you see the difference? In MHC class 1, the infected cell shows the label of being infected. In MHC class 2, there's no infection. Cell engulfs the pathogen, destroys it, and presents the piece of it on its surface. So what is the purpose of training? And I will explain how. So, so far, let's stick to this, MHC1, MHC2. Okay, that's what we have to know. And now we're going to actually move on to the T cells. Quick reminder, T cells originate in the bone marrow and travel to the thymus where they mature. Now T cells, unlike B cells, cannot just recognize antigen. Remember what we pictured for B cells. It has a a B cell receptor, and as soon as it recognizes the antigen, it undergoes differentiation and proliferation. Does it make sense? Remember we talked about it? Okay, they become plasma cells and plasma and memory B cells. That's for B, that's for B. Okay? 
Just just a reminder, okay? I'm going to put reminder. What will happen, we will take T cell, which does have T cell receptor, and expose it to the antigen. Turns out, nothing. Because why? Antigen has to be presented. Are we cool on that notion? Antigen has to be presented. Right? How that happens, the presentation of antigen. Here comes our um, MHC type 2. Imagine that this blue cell is the dendritic cell. You follow. If you're not following, let me know. The microbe gets phagocytosed. Okay. And inside of the dendritic cell, it's chopped in pieces. One of the pieces is presented by MHC class 2. Do you understand that, that thing? It was brought in the cell, it was destroyed, broken into pieces, and one of the pieces is presented on the surface of the dendritic cell. This T cell can recognize. So T cell now can recognize the antigen with its T cell, well, it's called TCR, T cell receptor, okay? Does it make sense? Hmm? Say again? In the middle, no. Direct exposure to the antigen, T cell cannot directly recognize the antigen. It cannot. It doesn't see it. Does that make sense? We'll get to that. We'll get to that. So far, I'm, I'm going step by step, okay? We try to eat an elephant piece by piece. Um, so, this will activate T cell. Does that make sense? And differentiation and proliferation. Does that make sense? So essentially, if now I want someone to play a role of B cells. You don't have to. You don't have to go anywhere. Okay. I think I have enough. Beatrice, would you help me just a little? So, B. Imagine that it's just easier. Beatrice is the B cell, and Michael is the T cell. It's just closest. So, B cell. If B cell encounters antigen, can you get? Can you get activated directly? If you encounter antigen directly, if you're B cell. Up there. Yes, if you're B cell, you can. Now, if you're T cell and you encounter antigen directly, no, T cell cannot get activated. But if I am dendritic cell and I chopped up the pathogen and now I present antigen, can you get activated? No, T cell can. You see the difference? You talk. Uh, so you're talking about dendritic cell. Well, yeah. So the B cell has a receptor for 
antigen and can be directly activated. Exactly. The dendritic cell has the receptor, but because it's chopping it up. T dendritic cell simply phagocytose the antigen. Dendritic cell will phagocytose, will destroy every antigen it encounters. Dendritic cell is a main type of antigen presenting cell. So the T cell is more like a helper for the B and the C and C. Well, no, Dendri dendritic cell is presenter. It's like a, a coach. Yeah. Dendritic cell says, "This is what you're gonna kill." Okay, this is what you're gonna find. B cell doesn't need instructions from dendritic cells. B cell can directly recognize the antigen. Straightforward. Does that make sense? T cell has to have that demonstration. Has to have the presentation of the antigen. We're going to talk about helpers. Yes. Well, they not only with dendritic, with others. You're kind of running ahead of the train a little bit. Okay, we'll get there. Now, what I want you to get out of this is that T cell has to recognize antigen that is bound to MHC. Okay? Does that make sense? It can only recognize antigen that is bound to MHC. It cannot recognize the free one. Now, if we go back a little bit to the point where T cell matures, we now can figure out which questions. Remember we asked a question to the B cell. What does it have to do? So T cell during maturation, what does it have to be? So you have naive T cell. So it has to have, it has to be able to do two things. First, it has to recognize MHC. Does that make sense? It has to be able to see that molecule. It has to be able to see MHC molecules. It again, you're running ahead of the train. It does for different types, but generally, it has to be able to see MHC. Okay, we'll get to different types. So the question: recognizes MHC. There are two answers. No and yes. If no, do we need such T cell? If it no. If it doesn't recognize MHC, it goes to apoptosis. If it does recognize MHC, then the next question that we have to ask is. Does it attack self antigens? And what do you want? Which answer do you want? No, it does not attack self antigens. So we get the answer no. And that's going to be your mature T cell. If the answer is yes, then it goes to apoptosis. Does that make sense? That's the process of T cell maturation. Remind me in which organ it happens. Maturation happens not in the bone marrow. Thymus, yes. The naive T cells are produced in the bone marrow but mature in thymus. Clear? So I have mature T cell. It goes into the lymphatic organs, like lymph node, and at a certain point, it gets directly exposed to the antigen. Is anything happening? No, because it is. if it gets directly exposed, nothing is happening. Sometime later, 
it gets presented with an antigen. Okay? And the, hmm? Get in there. Get in there. Get in there. You're too anxious to find an answer. We're getting there. So, it is presented by the dendritic cell. Okay, so dendritic cell teaches T cell the antigen recognition. And T cell becomes one of two types. It essentially differentiates. There's a population, well, I'm a little bit, wait, I'm a little bit um, off the chart here. So there are two types of T cells, CD4 and CD8, okay, before antigen exposure. CD4 cells are generally considered helper. CD8, killer. Okay? Now, CD8 cells will go out in the blood. Well, they all go out in the blood, but CD8 cells will circulate in the body. And the purpose is to find and recognize the infected cell, the infected cell, and kill it. What MHC type is on every nucleated cell in the body? Huh? Type 1, yes. MHC type 1. So CD8 cells will recognize MHC type 1. Does that make sense? CD4 cells cannot do that. Instead, since they're called helpers, they're going to help other cells, like macrophages and B cells, to better do their job. Which MHC type we can find on macrophages and B cells? MH, MHC2. Okay. They, CD4s are like football coaches. You don't see a football coach going on the field and throwing the ball. They are on the sidelines, right? But they, without their advice, the team cannot do a squat, right? So, coach doesn't do anything, coach tells what to do. Same goes for CD4 cells. They don't kill anything, but kind of coach other cells how to do their job better. So they recognize MHC2. And this differential recognition is called, it's a very specific term, this is called MHC restriction. How can you remember which one is which? I usually have a, I have my own, my own mnemonic rule, which says it's always eight. Four multiplied by two is eight. Eight multiplied by one is eight. Does that make sense? It may, it may help you. Does that make sense? Good. So, <coughs> When this guy, CD4 and CD8 cells, become presented with antigen, they differentiate and proliferate. Remind me what proliferation means. Huh? They become more... I'm deaf, that's professional. More abundant, more numerous, right? Differentiation means they become more specialized. So CD8 cells become cytotoxic lymphocytes. The acronym is CTL. Uh, the immunological jargon which is pretty common, is they're called killers. So killer T-cell. 
okay? CD4 cells can become several types, but I want to focus on two, okay? C, uh, T helpers and T regulatory. Um, not surprising, T helpers help and T regulatory cells regulate. Okay, so all these cells, T, uh, there are several kinds of T helper cells which I'm not planning to cover and I'm not planning about asking you. Okay, so these types of T cells are called effector cells because they produce effect. Does that make sense? All three of them. It's all effector cells. So when you know when the uh, you you see a T effector cell, it means it can mean cytotoxic lymphocyte, it can mean T helper, it can mean T regulatory cell. So that makes sense? just just terminology effector. Okay. Now let's figure out how they work. First, cytotoxic lymphocytes. So you have a um, um, CTL, okay, and you have a cell in the body that is infected. So there is an infection, okay. Cytotoxic lymphocyte. Okay, it's in the bottom. It's okay. So you have CDL, that an infected cell. How CTL, cytotoxic lymphocyte, knows that the cell is infected? Remind me. Presented on the cell. Yes, by which molecule? MHC1. Okay, that's okay. MHC class 1. So this cell... presents the antigen on its surface via MHC class 1. Does it make sense so far? <coughs> Sorry. Okay. We good? We good? Then understood? Okay. Now T cell has the T cell receptor. There are other molecules along with T cell receptor. Don't worry about them, not gonna ask them. T cell receptor. When T cell receptor recognizes the antigen on the cell surface, it initiates the killing mechanism. And the killing mechanism is the same as we discussed um, when we talked about natural killers. There are two ways. One, I'm going to kind of blow it up. Okay, one mechanism is by a fast ligand and fast receptor system. Okay, so when there's an interaction, it induces apoptosis. Does that make sense? It's a fragment of the wall. So it's fast ligand. Fast is some shortened, I don't even know where it comes from. R receptor. Does that make sense? That that interaction induces apoptosis. And the second mechanism is the release of granzymes and perforins. We talked about them before. 
So those are fragments of the cell membrane. Do you have perforins released? And you have granzymes released. Perforin is red, granzyme is blue. Okay? And that will also initiate, granzymes will initiate apoptosis. Does it make sense? So essentially, um, cytotoxic lymphocyte can induce apoptosis in the infected cell. Do you follow? Either by receptor ligand interaction or by releasing perforins and granzymes. It can do the same stuff with the cancer cells. Question? Questions? Yes. Okay. Presentation already happened. It's just how it kills. Imagine that in, I stab someone and then I pour acid into the wounds. Perforin perforates the membrane and granzyme then enters the membrane, the cell and initiates apoptosis. That's it. That's the whole story. Okay. Now, cytotoxic lymphocytes can kill infected or cancer cells. What about T helper cells? What they can do? They recognize what type of MHC? Two. And on which cells we can find MHC type 2? The dendritic, but they present two more macrophages, B cells. So T cell has the special receptor that would recognize MHC type 2. And if it recognizes MHC type 2 on the B cell, that presents the antigen, and I'm going to say that it's MHC type 2. What's the function of B cell? They do have memory component B cells, but what is the main function of B cells? They do, but that's how do they, what type of immune response they produce? Hmm? B cells. Anyone? There are two types of adaptive response cellular and humoral. And humoral response means what B cells produce. What type of molecules? Type of molecules that recognize antigen. Antibodies. Okay, B cells have to become plasma cells and produce antibodies. So, T cell, the helper T cell, will increase B cell activation, differentiation, proliferation. Essentially, T cell makes B cells more effective. Does that make sense? It's a coach, right? Quarterback can throw the ball without the coach, but with the coach, the game becomes much better. Does it make sense? T cell, T helper cell, stimulates B cell to become more effective. Does that make sense? So essentially, T helper cell links cellular and humoral immunity. Okay? It increases, it, it 
improves humoral immunity. Does that make sense? Any questions? They're in back. Okay. That's number. Look, look at this. T cell doesn't kill anything. It doesn't even come close to the actual antigen or infected cell. Okay. Another mechanism that it can do is to recognize the same MHC2, but now on the macrophage. What is the function of macrophages? Engulf and phagocytose, right? Destroy. That interaction increases macrophage activation. Does that make sense? Okay? Macrophages become more active. So they engulf, they, they are more active in searching and killing. That makes sense. That's the coach. T cell is the coach. Good? Now a little example. Now a little example. There's a disease, human disease, in which pathogen invades CD4 cells, kills them, essentially depriving a patient of all T helpers. What are, we're going to get to which disease is that. What are the consequences of getting rid of T helpers? Which, how? Huh? Woo, just from that picture. So B cells are depressed, the activity is depressed. Macrophages, depressed. Yes, there's another thing. T helpers actually stimulate CD8 cells. Not, not by interaction, they produce chemicals. CD8 stimulation via cytokines. Now, if you have no T cells, your CD8s are depressed. So getting rid of T helper cells depresses all branches of immune response. You get my point? You get my point? What's the name of that disease? HIV. HIV infects CD4 cells. Helper cells, they don't kill anything. They don't produce antibodies, nothing. Okay? Think about this. It's like, it's like a football team. Okay? You change, I don't know, a, a cornerback. That will have certain influence on the game. You change running back, it's going to have certain influence on the game. You change coach, or you get, oh, come on, my favorite team. Saints spend the entire season without a head coach, okay? They still managed to get 8-8. Eight, eight. Their defense was 32nd in the league, the worst in the history of NFL, you know? But so it was definitely a huge problem getting rid of a head coach. So if you get rid of that head coach, CD4 cells, getting rid of T helper cells, all other branches of, of adaptive immunity and some of innate, like macrophages, are going to be depressed. Do I make sense with that? Yes. Yes. It's not, I don't think it was HIV. Yes. Okay. That's a great treatment. So what I what I think they have done, uh, what I believe they have done, I don't think it was HIV, um, because it would be a little bit of a stretch to infect deliberately infect someone with HIV because the person can transmit it. It probably was another retrovirus. Now I want to make a point when we talk about retrovirus. We talk about. Uh, the virus that can incorporate its genome into the DNA of the helper cell, okay? 
We're not talking about this type of retrovirus. Okay. So probably that was some sort of a it's not a vaccine, but this virus either disrupted the cancer the, the oncogene in the T cell or introduced uh, the suppressor, the tumor suppressor gene that prevented her T cells to go completely crazy. But that's I'm I'm really happy to hear that it's now clinically used. It's really awesome. It's really awesome. Did she get a, a, a bone marrow Ganovich T cells? Yeah. Awesome. That's pretty impressive. It's pretty impressive. So that's that's the use of viruses in treatment. That's viral viral oncotherapy. Okay. So it probably disrupted the oncogene or introduced tumor suppressor gene. So T cells are not going crazy anymore. Huh? There is another, there is one more option I'm not really familiar by now to, to explain. I need to, I know that there is a third option when T cells become berserk against the cancer cells. Okay, I don't know what kind of leukemia she had. Okay, so these are the functions of T cells and I'm going to wrap it up quickly like a take home message. So T cells, sorry, <coughs> cytotoxic lymphocytes that are derived from CD8 cells recognize MHC class 1 on infected cell and destroy it by inducing apoptosis. I want to highlight they don't phagocytose. What are two phagocytes that we have? Huh? True phagocytes that kill other cells by engulfing them and just ripping them apart. Macrophages and neutrophils. B cells can engulf but for different purposes. They don't go per circuit on infection. Two type of phagocytes, macrophages and neutrophils. Okay. T helper cells play a role in activating CD8 cells by releasing cytokines. In increasing activation of B cells and increasing activation of macrophages. And this is how the cellular immunity is linked to the humoral and how adaptive immunity is linked to the innate. All right? Regulatory T cells. Um, I, I'm not really going to write anything about them. I'm going to make like a statement, okay? Just a little corner. We're gonna we're gonna do a little footnote to regulatory cells. They regulate, so their function is to control to decrease immune response. Why it's so important to decrease immune response? Eventually. So if white blood cells run around and then just go crazy, how do we call it? Autoimmune, right? So lack of T, a lack of uh, T regulatory cells is associated with autoimmune disease. This is not like my statement. It's a research. For instance, um, the abnormalities in T regulatory cells levels and migration and so on and so forth are associated with Crohn's. The problem is that we don't know how to treat, how to address this issue. You know, do should we do like T reg transplant or stimulate something? We don't really know. But we definitely know that T regulatory cells play very important roles in rheumatoid arthritis, Crohn's, IBD, and so on. 
So you have to know that they, they regulate and essentially dampen, suppress the immune response. Am I clear? So that's all you have to know about Tregs. Okay? Um, okay, it's not transplants yet. Hypersensitivities. Fun stuff. There are four types. We're going to start with, not surprisingly, type 1 hypersensitivity, which we also call an allergy. How does that work? Pretty much you sneeze. That's it. Okay, so primary exposure. It's the first time you're getting exposed to the allergen. Um, it may be not from one exposure, it may be multiple exposures. That what I suspect happened to me because I acquired my allergy to cats over a long period of time. Okay. So primary exposure. Your B cells recognize the allergen and produce plasma cells, blah, blah, blah. The result, immunoglobulin E. That makes sense so far. So B cells churn out, well, not B cells, plasma cells produce immunoglobulin E. Is that step clear? When immunoglobulin B, immunoglobulin E enters the circulation, it attaches itself to the mast cells and basophils. Mast cells and basophils now have immunoglobulin E. And are you allergic at this point? No. No, you're fine. That's your first exposure. But then, second exposure happens. Let's talk about mast cell. Basophil is going to have the same response, okay? Mast cell, immunoglobulin E, interacts with the allergen. The result of it is so-called degranulation. Immunoglobulin E stimulates degranulation. It, yes, it essentially serves as the allergen receptor on the mast cells. Um, what's in the granules in basophils and mast cells? The H word, histamine. And then you have all your symptoms. Um, what do we usually start with? When I have an allergy, I usually start with the runny nose. Okay, so histamine leads to the vasodilation in the nasal mucosa, increased production of nasal secretions, so I have a runny nose. Huh? Watery redness, vasodilation, also, histamine works on the nerve endings. That's why you're itchy. It can be on the eyes. It can be all over the body. Histamine release, vasodilation, and swelling uh, hives if it's local. Okay. Another contribution to runny nose, the lacrimal ducts become obstructed with the mucus from the nose, and tears just flow from your eyes instead of flowing into your nose. Okay. So we've got we've got it covered. 
um, scratch your throat. That's that's chemical effect. And if the degranulation happens systemically, bronchocons bronchoconstriction, okay, and histamine has opposite effects on the smooth muscles of bronchi and smooth muscles of blood vessels. It causes the contraction of smooth muscles of bronchi and bronchoconstriction and relaxation of smooth muscles of blood vessels, vasodilation. So the person cannot breathe, and when all blood vessels in the body dilate, what happens to the blood pressure? It falls down. This is called uh, it's not happened. It's anaphylactic shock. Person goes into shock because it doesn't just decrease; it drops. Okay, huh? Because heart tries to compensate for falling blood pressure, but cannot because it's so dilated. Okay, does that make sense? How can you? Hmm? Well, it's paused. Is there any way to prevent allergy? That Don't expose yourself to the antigen. Uh, is there any other way? Hmm? Yes, you can do antihistamine. You can do drugs that prevent the degranulation. Um, Benadryl, okay. Um, Claritin would be, would be good as well. Now, the trick with antihistamines, you <laughs> better take them before. I did several experiments on myself, not deliberately, but um, if I go, second, if I go to the house with a cat and I take Claritin there, I feel better by the time I'm home. But I feel pretty lousy there. If I take it two hours before the visit, I'm fine. Yes. This is called desensitization. You essentially expose your immune system to the same antigen. It's sort of a vaccine. Not, it doesn't work like a vaccine. Exactly the same mechanism, but the idea is that by exposing yourself to the allergen, you sort of teach mast cells and B cells and basophils not to respond. B cells not to produce IgE. Mast cells and basophils not to degranulate. Okay, um, it can happen. Some people when they leave, for instance, when they leave the cat for two, three weeks, when they go to the vacation, they come back for first one, two, three weeks. They have allerg allergy symptoms and then they become better. Um, there, so you can do it like in a fast, fast way. It's pretty much if we would want to get a cat, I would suffer for two, three weeks, you know, for instance. But then I will probably get used to it. Uh, another way is to use small doses of the allergen. But in this case, the problem is you have to know clearly what is the allergen. There is an approach like this, and there was a study when kids with uh, peanut butter allergy were treated for a certain period of time with extremely small doses of whatever protein they're allergic to in the peanut butter. And it improved their tolerance. They didn't become absolutely tolerant. But they, for instance, uh, they could be at the same table with someone who eats peanut butter sandwich. Does that make sense? So that th there is a, there is an approach. Of course, you can use you can use cortisol, okay, to treat inflammation, huh? Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. I believe it's a whatever it's a dose of whatever you are allergic to. And here's the thing, 
even in case of peanuts, we can say that whatever the component you're allergic to and we don't know, depending on the how it was processed, it may alter the response. Does that make sense? Does it does it make sense? Like uh, it was done in this facility, that facility, roasted versus salted, peanuts from this source, from that source. Maybe it's not peanuts. Maybe it's something else on the peanuts. So yeah, food, 